quote on this computer. Okay, perfect. So we've got Tom Flint uh, here to discuss some alternative ways of teaching filmmaking. Um, you guys were getting acquainted already, so it's, I don't want to take up more of your time, Tom, because I know Diana has to leave early. Diana, you're from University of Ottawa, did you say? Or Yes, okay. yeah. So uh, without further ado, it's all yours, Tom. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so just, um, I'll just give a quick introduction. Um, so my name is Tom Flint, and um, I'm originally from the, the Boston area, and um, I studied filmmaking when I was in university. And uh, after graduating from university, I moved to Japan where I lived for 13 years, working as both a freelance filmmaker and also a filmmaking educator at a high school outside of Tokyo. And um, I learned a lot when I was over there and it's kind of what led me to, to come back here to uh, graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design to study more about filmmaking pedagogy. And um, I'm in the process of writing my thesis right now. Um, it's the beginning of March right now and it's due in just about two months, which is kind of scary. But um, uh, the reason why I'm kind of um, doing this webinar today is just to get more information from different people in the field about um, where I might want to go with my thesis since I'm doing the, the editing and everything right now. So um, I'll just give you a quick kind of overview of what I'm hoping to do with this, this one hour. Um, so basically, as you can see from the title on the first slide here, uh, my research and the thesis I'm producing is related to alternative pedagogical approaches to K through 12 filmmaking. So it's not so much film studies, film aesthetics, it's more about the actual act of, of filmmaking um, or video production or whatever you want to call it. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is walking through my thesis chapter by chapter and asking for feedback and especially constructive criticism um, from you all so I can improve and fix any gaps that, that you think might, might be appearing. So I'm going to go through each chapter, chapters one, two, and three in chronological order. And then I'm gonna ask some specific questions related to the material that I've talked about in each chapter before I move on to the next chapter. And then at the end, we have about maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so, and I wanna open it up to um, some general questions and comments. So um, yeah, please hold on to your questions um, until the, the end. Thank you. Unless you have a, a, a very, very pressing question that you wanna know. So I'll move on to the, uh, the next slide. Oops, let's see. Okay, are you, is the, um, the image on the right, is this blocking part of the text? I'm, I'm seeing everything. You are, okay, because yeah. on my screen the image is blocking part, but okay, okay, but you can see it. All right, so, um, so here are just a couple of my, my major inquiries. Um, so uh, the first one is to what extent do we need to adopt the language process and technique of film into K through 12 filmmaking education? Which is a very kind of paradoxical uh, statement. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's an important one to ask. And the second one is how can emphasizing Japanese aesthetic and philosophical traits through filmmaking prepare students for their futures? Okay, so I'll move on. And my first chapter, um, as it states here, is basically about my experience in film school in the US and how reflecting on it led me to question um, some of the pedagogical practices that are found within uh, filmmaking education. And um, a lot of this revolves around the kind of product oriented industry model of filmmaking and should education model industry. And one of the largest debates I'm sure that you all know within the field is the whole product versus process um, discussion and which one makes more sense, if any. So um, I'm gonna be writing a bit about that. And I'm also gonna be writing about um, how I think that a lot of that revolves around the emphasis on certain industry standards and guidelines and how um, you know teachers are oftentimes training their students to make good looking films without asking what good really, really means, which is I think a very, very fundamental question that gets at the kind of part of the relativity of uh, found within art that we tend to overlook sometimes. So I think that's a question that we should be asking. And also related to um, uh, certain pedagogical traits that I believe are, are worth uh, questioning and how I think a lot of these things are related to a fear um, found um, among a lot of not only arts educators or filmmaking educators, but educators in general, where they feel that, and this is true with myself as well, that there's this pressure 
to get their students to produce films or products that look somewhat good, that have a certain kind of quality without really knowing what quality means. But I think that stems a lot from a fear that educators have that oftentimes they're not aware of that also comes from standards and pressure from um, you know, school standards. So I think there are connections between the standards, the, um, the kind of pressure that educators feel in order to teach their students these different techniques and guidelines in order to get their students to make films that in essence look good according to what they, they feel. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be writing about that as well. And um, I'll move on to the next slide. Can you see this okay? Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> yeah, good. Excellent. It's so silent, I can't hear any <laughs> ambient noise. So it's, I have good, no uh, it's good webinar etiquette. Yeah, okay, great. So, um, yeah, these are just some questions um, that I'm, I'm wondering about, that I'm going to be writing about in, in my first chapter. So, first of all, I wonder if there is an overemphasis on guidelines and film grammar. Um, for example, rules. Um, a lot of what I was doing my first year teaching filmmaking in Japan, which was based on what I had learned as a film student, was teaching my students about these different rules and, and guidelines that I had learned related to, for example, the 180 degree rule, the rule of thirds, you know, continuity. Again, trying to get my students to produce work that had some kind of quality to it without really questioning what quality or good or any of that meant. Um, and I, I think things like, yeah, continuity, script formatting, eyeline matching, these are things that are emphasized quite a bit, but I'm wondering if they need to be emphasized to the, to the degree that they are in a lot of um, curriculums. Also, if there's an overemphasis, I wonder if there's an overemphasis on the importance of having a contextual foundation. So I think context is obviously very, very important when you're teaching art or pretty much any subject, but I'm wondering if it's overemphasized and if when you teach context such as film history and um, this notion that you need to know the rules before you break them and all that. I'm wondering if that closes doors of, of possible avenues that students may explore on their own in terms of uh, actual exploration. Um, so that's something that I've never really agreed with. You need to know the rules before you break them. I, I absolutely disagree with that. And um, I'm not saying that it's wrong to um, show films of historical significance or anything, but I, I think it needs to be done in the right way. Um, also, um, I wonder if there's an overemphasis on the importance of having a clear vision when making a film. You know, that's something that I was always told as a film student, my educators were always telling me in college and in high school, you know, you need to know what you wanna say if you're directing a film, you need to have a clear vision. And I could understand that the, my teachers were trying to push me in the direction of thinking very critically about what I wanted to say. But what I've learned living in Japan is that you don't need to know what you want to say. In fact, that's why we create art. That, that's why we paint. That's why we write. That's why we make films is precisely because we don't know what we want to say and we figure it out as we go along. So I think that's something very fundamental that we should be uh, looking at. And finally, uh, I wonder if there's an overemphasis on structure, especially during the pre-production phase. Um, so I think, again, pre-production is obviously a great opportunity for students to learn really, really important skills. Um, for example, writing a script, there's a lot you can learn from that. Um, storyboarding, it's a fun activity that students can learn from, but I, I wonder if it's overemphasized because what I've seen through some of the internships that I've been doing, one in New York, one outside of Providence, including working with my own students in Japan, is that when pre-production and structure is emphasized to too strong a degree, and I'm going to be going into this a little bit more later, the mind, I think, of the students kind of shuts down a bit. And it can feel to the students that the actual making of the film and the post-production as well is simply executing what they've already decided. So they're not really absorbing as much as they could be absorbing from the actual act of filmmaking. And um, I think that, again, that, that connects somehow to a fear among educators where they feel that they, they need to have their students understand the structure and how to make a film, when in fact there is no how to make a film before they actually let them loose to, to produce what they want to. So these are things that I'm uh, going to be questioning. So on to um, the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me um, quickly ask a, a question. This is the end of chapter one. 
So um, just a couple of questions for you guys in general. Um, related to this, where do you think there's room for growth um, in terms of K through 12 filmmaking pedagogy today? That's just a general question. Well, <laughs> I'm K through four, so okay. any growth, <laughs> um, preferable. I, I don't know of a lot of places that are doing it. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's tough to say, not having a, a really broad experience of it hmm. beyond hmm. what, beyond my school in particular and beyond give me five. Okay. Okay. But I mean, for example, Brian, in, in your work, do you think that, um, have you come across anything that could be emphasized more or is, is um, being overemphasized that, that you felt as an educator? Well, I, I, I like what you're saying about the, um, the overemphasis because I, I do see a tendency towards putting it out there as if that, that, that know the rules to break the rules. I, I try to view it more as here, here's what I can share with you. Absolutely get rid of it if if you want I, i'm i'm just showing you what i know mm. um so we, what you've just said is pretty interesting that and i'd like to hear more about it um but yeah I, i'm a huge proponent of there is no one way of doing any of this stuff mm. Mm. so maybe the and from a public excuse me public school setting it's it is really tightly wrapped around those standards mm. um, so mm. that that's but that's not just film education that's everything right it's absolutely across the culture um, yeah. and that from what you're describing that's what i go to pains to do with with my groups that i don't have to meet the standards with which mm. is here's a camera explore if if you want some help i'm here for that if you think you know what you're doing go for it try things out and fail and i think in, in the broader sense that that openness to failing is is a huge place that where things need to grow absolutely yeah mm -hmm. yeah definitely and i just want to quickly mention that that brian and i um, we met just for the first time a few weeks ago at this uh, give me five um one day youth filmmaking workshop and don't you think that went just like extraordinarily like the whole day was like perfect oh that, that, that give me five is always fantastic but that day in particular was uh i went i, I always start the day off a little nervous i even said to my wife I'm nervous and uh, you know, I don't even know how many of them I've done, but by the end of the day, I yeah. couldn't remember why I was nervous. You know, I, I guess I just don't want the kids to fail, which is, see, that's part of my culture is, is like, no, let them fail. Cause it, it's all part of that process. Your, your use of the word process, especially mm. a lot mm. of people fail to grasp how important process is. And, and it, what you're talking about is innovation, mm. no matter what the discipline is though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, does anyone else have any 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 comments? No, um, I have a few things. I came to this. I mean, I actually took Yonti did a workshop at URI. I'm not, you might have been there, Frank. Um, I'm not sure if you've done Yonti's make a video in one hour workshop or not. He's done them over the past you know, past years. Um, but anyway, so and what Yonti did and what I really loved was the fact that we were de-emphasizing the tech aspect or the production aspect. And we were actually just, I mean, the first thing I do in my research and with the with teacher candidates here at University of Ottawa, we don't have video happening in the elementary schools. And so it's something new. Um, we're trying to convince them that it's a new, you know, it's a literacy and that in order to bring, make room for it in the classroom, they're integrating in, into other subject areas, especially language arts. And so in order for them to make time for it, they have to, I think, experience the hands-on experience of making a video themselves. Absolutely. So when I teach it, again, it's in a one, three-hour class. Um, they're given a challenge. They work in teams to collaborate. We don't even talk about the technology. I mean, just shoot something. We're focusing on the critical content and the curriculum expectations. Um, and so because I'm not a filmmaker, um, that's, you know, and I also did a study. I followed three YouTubers around for a number of years. And so I'm also coming at it from the perspective of YouTubers and youth who have, who do not, I mean, 
they do not follow any rules. Hmm. And in fact, we worked with a, a doc maker here from Toronto, um, trying to edit our little, we made a documentary sh showcasing their work. And we had a lot of conflicts with the doc maker because the, the youth who are now, you know, in their mid twenties. So at the time they were like 20, um, they didn't, they didn't want to follow those conventions and um, you know, their message was the most important. Now they were using, you know, film to create the message and of course anything you learn is always going to help you but it was like a quick let's get it done um sort of that spirit mm. and I don't think that that's a bad thing especially at the elementary level because the main thing is you want to get the video making happening oh yeah and once yeah. the teachers make up one video themselves they're sold on it and mm. off they go. And then we can talk about, you know, more deep, more in-depth things. The type of course that you're talking about would only appear in our secondary curriculum. Like there are a couple of special courses, which would focus more on the, you know, the traditional doc making steps or, or whatever in the technical aspects. So I really personally think, um, I mean, I guess it depends on your local curriculum, but I think just get them making the videos for now. And once we do that, we can really move on somewhere with it. Yeah, that kinesthetic, um, I don't know, aspect of filmmaking and how that kind of creates a lot of excitement. It is just so, crazy. So important. Also, the other thing is, I don't know if you've read Sarah Pink's work. She has a lot to say about visual, um, communicating visually, and it's different than script writing. And she'll have a lot, if you look at her work, she'll have a lot to say about writing a script and then transforming that into a visual medium hmm. is not necessarily the way that you want to go. I mean, I think she would agree with you that it's an artistic process. Hmm. You don't hmm. necessarily know at the onset what it's going to be. Now, yeah. the dog maker we worked with was very linear and he wanted it all laid out. And the four, the three young females and myself, we did, we kind of didn't want to do it that way. But anyway, so there are different, I don't, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but there may, maybe there people need options. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's essentially what I'm arguing for in my thesis. So that I'm not saying that there's a right way to do it, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to get educators in the field to recognize the extent to which film can be played with. Oh, and that play period. And that's I, another thing is the play period is really important. You know, like the, how long they might play with it for, you know, all of elementary school, like who knows, right? Right, but right. I, I, I've, I've learned to... And, and this is an evolving process, so I don't know what year I'm in even, but it was hard to step away and, and just let them just play. And, mm -hmm. and from the tech end, I, I explain the mechanics behind how to use it so that I'm not losing cameras every other week. Mm -hmm. But after that, just explore. And sometimes you get kids who want that extra guidance, which I'm, I'll be there for, but sometimes you get kids that, and we're talking eight and nine year olds that will just say, okay, go away. And getting comfortable with that has been um, a very cool thing for me to see that it's great. Cause I'm, oh, I'm just online here. I think play, especially at the elementary level has to enter into it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, it goes back to this kind of um, what I feel is an overemphasis on, on structure, especially in pre-production and how and to a certain degree, that, that takes away from the excitement of the, um, the actual filmmaking process because you'll see kids in hallways or of the school or wherever shooting their films that they've been instructed to do, and they have the script in their hands. Sometimes they'll have the slate, and they're just, again, executing what they've already decided. So it loses that kind of spontaneity to it. Yeah. They don't, where, where they, it's like a map in their hand, and they know more or less the direction where they're going to go, and then of course they're going to change certain things. But what I'm arguing is that there shouldn't really be a map. There should be a concept. There shouldn't really be a, a map that you're holding in your hand all the time. There should be a concept, of course, of what you think you may want to create. But it's this constant, I'll go into this more in my third chapter, but um, it's this constant, continuous exploration. Exactly, yeah, I was um, just going to say exploration. You point the car and you just head in a direction. Yeah, yeah. And in the context of education, I mean, think about it that kind of um it's like continuous problem solving compare that to having this kind of structured kind of in a sense preordained way of making a film which models industry standards yeah um i'm yeah. not saying again that one is better than the other but I, i'm i'm saying that we should we should look at, at alternative methods you know yeah. could i could i be a devil's advocate here for a second oh sure yeah please 
Uh, Carolyn, hi, sorry, I came in late. Um, I was a long time 12th grade English teacher and I'm thinking of a couple of constraints that come into play mm. when a teacher has a prescribed curriculum and mm. then does an overlay of something like this film production. And I just thought I'd throw this at you that, for example, in, in English, there are uh, some standards about mm. incorporating figurative language through symbolic representation mm -hmm. that does require a good amount of advanced planning to mm -hmm. understand those tropes and all and then to execute them in a visual way it's kind of contrary to the way they've been taught to do a writing process approach mm -hmm. to uh, developing an idea so i'm i'm i can see your point about spontaneity mm -hmm. i'm not sure that if you want to have a fully realized end product that it that it could be strictly spontaneous right then, secondly you are talking about k-12 right yes that's right okay so k-12 contexts have a lot of rules that that teachers have to follow and so just having kids out in the hallway is tremendously risky for a teacher especially mm -hmm a non-tech ed teacher or a non-tv and film production teacher so having those strips scripts gives the teacher the credibility with the administration so not mm -hmm. to have those you know would, yeah. would be kind of difficult and then the third point is i think a lot of teachers don't develop uh parts of their curriculum that can address the standards of media production because they're not familiar themselves with the tools to mm -hmm. guide the students. And I can hear Brian there with Yanti talking. Yeah. And if the teachers don't know the tools, it's very difficult because you do have a wide range of learners. And so how do you help the kids who don't have the previous expertise, whether it's because of class systems, whether it's because of lack of access at home, whether it's because they just didn't take the course, you know? Yeah. So, the thing that's always worked for me is having a critical friend, another teacher who's willing to say swap prep periods, come in and help me and then I'll go help you. The librarian was great like that. I used to go sit during my prep period and help her do ma uh, room management while she had like 100 kids in the library and she would come help me during her prep to learn how to use the tools. So that way then I would have a certain infused background confidence to execute this so just some practical things if you could get in a k-12 classroom and and help a teacher to execute this you would see some of those backgrounds maybe you have and i don't know i didn't hear that part so. yeah no carolyn thank you thank you so much i mean this is exactly why i'm doing this is to be kind of challenged and and um i mean you said devil's advocate that's exactly what i want to hear and those are really 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 good points that I hadn't really, um, I mean, those are things that I'm now going to have to address in my thesis in some form or another. Yeah, so, she hit it on the head with the, uh, the administrator. If yeah. You, so the way I was able to, to start doing what I was doing, uh, a reading <clears throat> specialist wanted to film a fake newscast, and I said, well, why don't we make a real one? And I brought in my green screen and made a real one and then showed that to my administrator. And mm -hmm. that was what set the ball rolling. So you do, you do have to keep in mind that credibility factor. So I can't, and so I'm the librarian um, in my school, Carolyn, and, and coming from the television background, I'm the person they can go to, so that helps. But if you don't have that background, you, you do have to make a case for it. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry, to, I'm gonna have to uh, move on just because we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, so, um, let's see. Are you able to see this chapter two slide now? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but basically my second chapter is going to be what I see uh, are basically signs of kind of expansion within the field. Um, different programs in school, out of school that um, are kind of, you know, moving in a sense away from this kind of industry centric uh, pedagogical method of, of teaching filmmaking. And they're, they're playing with it more, you know, they're using it more liberally in a sense. So I'm going to be looking at in-school and out-of-school programs that teach filmmaking in different ways, pedagogical camps, patterns and trends in the field that move away from the, um, 
yeah, the industry oriented method. So I, I did um, an independent study and uh, an internship during the winter session, which was about six weeks long. And I spent most of my time in New York City and I visited just a, a whole ton of programs, um, some great, great, great programs. And I also interned at this high school called the Cinema School in the, uh, the Bronx. And um, yeah, I learned a lot. And I'm basically going to be surveying probably five or six different programs and looking at um, different trends uh, that are within the field. A very common one, of course, is product versus process. Um, another one that Renee Hobbs pointed out in one of her, her articles um, was this protectionism versus empowerment. I don't know if you guys have seen that graphic. It's really, really interesting. Another one is th that I kind of... Um, uh, unearthed was active learning or sorry active or learning filmmaking through active learning or more through passive learning are the students spending more time as you mentioned Diane um, making films and learning through the act of making films so it's more experiential or are they learning about film and you know film analysis film history and so on um, so anyway um, let's uh, yeah I'm gonna move on quickly to the third chapter um, let's skip a little part here so my third chapter is really where I, I think it's going to be the meat of my thesis. And it's going to be where I'm basically taking my experience in Japan, what I learned, how I changed, and depositing it in here for other educators to see. And this is just a quote that I want you guys to look at. Film is for discovering the world, not for creating your world. And this was spoken by um, the Japanese filmmaker that I studied under named Nobuhiro Suwa, who is uh, just a brilliant, brilliant um, man. And he was the one that really challenged me and pushed me um, in a new direction. And um, basically, everything that I learned from him is, is what I'm going to be putting in my, my thesis and how it relates to traditional Japanese aesthetics. So my third chapter uh, is basically about my experience teaching filmmaking in Japan, the approach I adopted, and why I think it should be considered as an alternative methodology. And um, just a few, um, well, let me start quickly by, by saying that when Sua, the, the, the mentor that I had, when he was <clears throat> teaching these, um, sorry, it was me who was teaching the high school course, but he would come in event, uh, occasionally to kind of lecture to the students. And one of the things that he said um, was, he said to the students, when you're making a film, it's like you're, you're trying to cross a river. You know, it's, it's some kind of a, a challenge that you have. And he said, how do you do that? What a lot of people do, um, in the case of Hollywood, for example, Hollywood industry filmmaking, is they build a bridge made of bricks. And he was explaining this so the students could understand it more easily. And he said the bricks are all the same size. They've been, you know, manufactured to fit together. Um, they've been, um, you know, they're very architecturally set together. And what normally happens when a film is made, in most, most cases, um, is, as I said before, everything is strategically, structurally, systematically planned out. Um, and it's kind of executed in the way that you want it to be, according to um, you know, the, the blueprint, the script, the storyboards, whatever. And so that's the, the way that a film is, is normally made. It's a very kind of risk-free way in the sense that you're, um, you know, in the industry, of course, time is money, right? It's an entrepreneurial industry, so you have to know exactly what you're gonna be doing on the floor. So you plan everything out and then you execute it. That's the way it's simply done. And um, so he described that as a brick bridge methodology. Um, he said the other way to do it or another way to do it is to look down the river and you'll see a few stones Just somewhere down the river that you may be able to use to get to the other side He said the stones are already there. They're part of the natural world. They're different sizes. They've been shaped by nature They're a little bit slippery if you try and cross using the stones you might slip and fall in there's a lot more risk involved but it's this kind of method of exploration where you don't really know where you're going to end up. You have an idea of what you want to do, but it's this process of, of continuous discovery. So he described that as the stone bridge kind of method. And I was really, really intrigued by that. And I think that's kind of, um, you know, a good model to, to be looking at. And this is what essentially my, my third chapter is going to be based on, which is this kind of brick bridge methodology. And as I have here, um, it shows that it's something that emphasizes continuous exploration, which is merging the pre-production, production, and post-production phases into one continuous kind of problem-solving um, exercise, basically. And it also emphasizes things like adaptability, 
because you don't really know where you're going. So you have to be kind of on your toes and you have to accept what's coming to you and you have to kind of integrate yourself into the world that is already there and use the filmmaking process as a chance to discover what's in the world in front of you rather than just realize, to use a strong word, your ego, you know? And um, this relates a lot to some of the philosophical differences between East and West um, and how the West is a very logic-based, um, um, you know, the societies that we live in. It goes all the way back to Socrates, you know, Greek philosophy. And in the East, we have, um, you know, cultures like Japan and China, which are very much predicated on Buddhism and how it has a lot to do with letting go and integrating yourself into the world and kind of compromising. And um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in, uh, in a bit. But also you can see here that it, it allows, I think, um, the filmmaker to get more in touch with their intuition. So instead of just following this, this kind of set plan, you, you listen to yourself more. You, you have to, again, be on your toes. So you have to just go with your gut instinct. And I think that's something that art really gives students the chance to do. And we learn all these different subjects when we're in school. And also from our parents and from society, it's all about structure and telling us where to go and what to do. So I think art should be an opportunity for students to really, you know, go back to being children and listening to what the inside of them is telling them what to do. And I think sadly, a lot of, um, you know, what we see in art curriculums moves away from that. And they try to integrate more of a logical approach into, into creating things, which has some benefits, of course. But um, I think this is a chance really for students to explore and not know where they're going and learn from the process and take more risks and go outside of their comfort zone. So that's essentially what, what I'm arguing for. So just a quick analogy to explain this a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to really explain to you how to make a pot in, in the Western world, but as you can see from these images, are you able to see these right now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So as you can see from the images, um, it involves a lot of calculation, a lot of careful thinking, where essentially the potter is, um, well, something's blinking here. Okay, sorry, something was blinking on my screen. Where the potter has an idea of, um, of what they wanna create and they do their best to execute it. It's very straightforward, but it involves a lot of um, careful planning and um, minute decisions and essentially getting the product that they're making as close as possible to what they think it should be. Um, moving on to the next slide. Are any of you familiar with the process of uh, Raku? Not by that name anyway. Okay, okay. Well, it's a traditional form of, of pottery making in Japan. And it's quite different from how it's done in the West. And essentially what happens is the, the Raku potter, um, of course they know what they're, they're going to make, which is usually a tea bowl, and which is used in the Japanese tea ceremony. But the method is very different. So they don't use a wheel. They shape everything by their hand. And it's this kind of continuous process of, uh, of discovery where, they, where they're feeling things out and they're really relying on their intuition and their, their kind of um, instinct in order to form the pot. And then when they've finally gotten it to where they, they think it should be, they put it in the kiln. And rather than leaving it in there for a couple of days until it gets really hard, they take it out after like two or three hours. So it's piping hot. And what happens is um, it goes through this process of reduction where it kind of takes on a life of its own. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen Japanese pottery before, but it's very, very different. Traditional Japanese raku pottery. It's very different from what you um, might think of pottery to be. It's, it's usually deformed in some way. It has the, this kind of very, very aesthetically kind of unpleasing look to it. And they, they look really ugly to the kind of untrained eye. And, um, but the magic of it is that you, you let go and you don't know what it's going to become. And then you're always surprised by what it ends up becoming. And um, I think this is an interesting model to look at. And it's something that you can learn from within the context of education, because again, rather than just executing in the case of filmmaking, what you've already decided you want your film to be, you don't know what it's going to be like and you let go. 
and you kind of embrace that and you learn things along the way that you had no idea you were going to encounter. And um, that's how a lot of Raku potters describe the process is they're always surprised by what the pot ends up becoming, the color. They oftentimes don't know what the color is going to be, where the cracks are going to be, um, because they've only taken it out after, after a couple of hours. So I think if you kind of um, apply that to um, youth filmmaking, um, it's a really interesting approach that, that we might want to look at. And here's how it connects to um, some kind of fundamental Japanese aesthetic and philosophical principles. So again, letting go of the desire to control. You know, and again, in the West in general, a lot of it is about control, control, control. How do I get it the way I want it to be? But in, um, you know, traditional Japanese philosophy, um, not always, but a lot of the time, it's about letting go of that. And that's how it relates to uh, Zen Buddhism. Also, the theme emerges more organically. So rather than deciding the, the theme of the film, the story and the message that you want to get across to your audience and then producing the film according to those kind of guidelines that you've set for yourself, the theme emerges more organically. And that goes back to what I was saying before about the reason why we make films is because we don't know exactly what we want to say, right? We figure it out as we go along and we learn from the process. And also um, cinema gives you the opportunity to escape from meaning. And I think meaning making is, is emphasized, again, this relates to logic and rationality, emphasized all the time in education. And that's very important. We always ask the question, why? Why are you doing that? Why? To get our students to think more critically. But I think one of the magical things about cinema and art in general is that it escapes from meaning sometimes. Sometimes you can't define it. So those are the films that I like to watch, at least, are the ones that you can't really decode. Like if you watch a Hitchcock film, for example, I don't want to get like overly philosophical. I, I, I love Hitchcock, but when you watch his films, you can see the decisions that he made very carefully. You know, he all, all, often talked about when he was shooting his films and editing his films, it was totally boring for him because he knew exactly what he, what he wanted. He had the storyboards in his head. But um, I think, um, with certain films, they just kind of come into being. They come into being. That's the way uh, Matsuo Basho, the famous um, uh, poet from Japan, the, uh, the haiku poet, described poetry. He didn't say, I, wrote, I, I write my poems. He said, my poems come into being. So it's very different from the way we look at art making in, in the Western world for the most part. And I think it's an interesting model. Also, again, opening yourself up and connecting to the world, to the natural world, goes back to that kind of Stonebridge idea, right? And finally, it's important not to have a clear, clear vision. That's, that's vitally important. So when my teachers in film school were telling me, you, you, you need to know what you want to say, it's very important to communicate those things to your, your team and so on and so forth. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, um, what about um, just finding it as you're going along and having a concept, but communicating with your team and using that opportunity to collaborate with them and try and figure out together what you're going to be doing. I think that's something, again, that we should be looking at. So um, here's just a, a quick graphic that describes um, very, very simply, and of course there's all kinds of alterations to this and iterations. But essentially, um, if you look at the, at the left, um, image, we have the brick bridge approach, which emphasizes pre-production. So basically, most of the decisions are made, you know, during the pre-production process. And, um, you know, we have the script writing, we have the storyboarding, and there's so many things, of course, that students can learn through this. But what happens when you do that is that some of the excitement, I think, is sometimes lost, because production and post-production end up just being executing what you've already decided. It's kind of like homework for a lot of students. In the case of post-production, for example, they're editing their films and they're just, you know, to, to varying degrees, gluing together the pieces that they already know where, where they belong. Whereas if you look over on the right, the Stonebridge approach goes all the way through. It's continuous exploration. You're always problem solving in your mind with your, with your team members. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? You're following this kind of rough path that you're going on. And in the case of post-production, um, it's more than just, you know, aligning the, the shots that you um, have filmed and uh, knowing more or less where they're gonna be going. Instead of that, the post-production process is, becomes much more difficult and much more challenging because the story hasn't fully formed yet and the theme hasn't fully formed. 
So think about that within the context of education. It could be really, really, really interesting. There's a lot to learn from that. Lots of critical thinking going on, lots of creative thinking, right? So it's just straight all the way through. And of course, the brick bridge approach very much models um, what's going on in the industry. Because again, time is money, right? It's all about, we have 14 hours on the set. We need these shots. Let's go get them, right? So that's why the preparation is, is vitally important. But do we need to apply that to, you know, youth filmmaking education all the time? I, I don't think so. Um, so finally, this is my last slide. These are just some major um, kind of Stonebridge attributes, which some of which, of course, appear in um, a more industry centric kind of model. But continuous problem solving, um, taking risks, you know, step, stepping outside your comfort zone, opening yourself up. Um, examining the world more closely, relinquishing control, that's a really, really big one. And that's how it, of course, connects to Japan. Uh, looking at film in a meta way. So you're not trying to get your students to make good films. You're, 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 in a sense, zooming out. And you still have film at the center, but you're looking at the bigger picture. Um, there are no rules. That's something that I learned working with, with Sua. That was the first thing he told the students. Were that there, were, there are no rules in filmmaking, in art. You know, we tend to, to think that as, as, as educators. I certainly do with my students. I, I used to teach them, you know, you, there, there, are these, there are rules. You can break them if you want, but there are, there are certain rules. But no, there aren't. It's art. That's the beauty of art is that it gives us the chance to um, do, do what we want. So I'm not saying that everything should be arbitrary and unmotivated and um, you... Uh, shouldn't have a reason for everything you're doing um, because, and this is one of the kind of tricky points with writing a thesis um, in regards to this, because it's very, very much about intuition and what you're feeling. But um, I, I'm just questioning the degree uh, to which we need to focus on, you know, meaning and structure and um, this, these kind of things that are, are prevalent within the industry model of filmmaking. So um, that's that. That's my third chapter. And I just have like one or two questions that I want to ask, and then we'll open it up to kind of a, a discussion at the end. Is that okay, Brian? Yeah. Mm -mm. Yep. Great. Um, so first of all, um, I'm looking for gaps. Anything that you guys notice um, might be, uh, you know, criticism that I might face um, with people who, who read this kind of material. Um, anything at all, just, you know, feel free to throw it at me. I'd love to hear it. Well, I can tell you as, as um, someone working in the public school, school system, again, Caroline hit it on the head as far as you're going to get a lot of pushback. <clears throat> I have the luxury of my position being pretty open, where, whereas a classroom teacher, and I love what you're saying here, but a classroom teacher is not going to be able to, at, at current culture, be able to... Um, justify mm. that I, I, th I think that the the stone bridge is is there's beautiful aspects of that i just don't know how it's going to translate into the public school system mm. so there are probably a lot of private schools mm. where you can do that um, where exploration and actual learning is the goal um so that's the big one i see yeah yeah that's that's a really good point well, I, yeah. Can I speak to that? Oh, yeah, please. I think that um, once you take the risk, I think it's the new tech, you know, the new technologies are all about risk taking. And this is a new technology for in the classroom, you know, the digital aspect. And I think that once you take a risk and you see what the kids are able to produce in this open ended is how I would view it process and how excited they are and the learning that does take place that you'll quickly, you know, overcome those kinds of constraints because it is so exciting. Um, video is, we're in a post uh, tech society now. Video is a dominant form of communication and kids need to know how to make, you know, messages or communicate with video. And I, the, the projects that I've seen not only teacher candidates do, but teachers in the schools and kids in the schools have been so exciting that I think maybe, hopefully, that will, you know, counter this need for structure yeah that's, then, that's what i that's just my opinion pardon if i could jump in next oh, um, yes 
I just loved the third chapter. And I'm wondering if you are trying to present this to public school teachers, if that shouldn't be the first chapter. Start with the gifts, the optimism, yeah. the mm. potential. And perhaps it needs to have an interdisciplinary component where you do reach out to the phys ed teacher who is teaching yoga, or you do reach out to the uh, counseling staff who is working on uh, self-reflection and meditation techniques, and you make this more of a team, a multidisciplinary approach that is positioned as being really new and innovative. Mm. That's where you'll get teachers to buy in because mm. everybody wants to be part of something new and wonderful and on the edge. And there's a big, big push toward Eastern philosophy now. Oh, really? Because very uncertain, difficult times. Yeah. And there's something that's so wonderful about reaching out to approach that is calming and thoughtful and mindful. So it's a little, I mean, I loved the ending, totally loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great comments. Yeah. I mean, Diane, you were just mentioning, um, I think it was before the two of you guys got on, but we were just talking about Japan and I'm sure you noticed that traveling there, that it's just a different culture. There's a, there's yeah. more, I mean, it, it's a, it's a collective culture. It's all about the group consciousness which Holistic, is really different yeah. from the individualism. Yeah. The and I work, I work with Ted Aoki's theory um, in curriculum studies and he's a Canadian Japanese theorist. And so I think, you know, those ideas are very attractive to me. Yeah. yeah. But I think a lot of that can be learned through this type of approach again, where it's not just, you know, trying to realize what you've already decided and kind of push your ego. I um, mean, that's a strong way to put it, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of loosening yourself up and kind yeah. of be becoming more malleable and adaptable and listening more closely to what your, your partners are saying, because no one knows exactly where, where you're going. Which is, which is what sums up the, what I said as a challenge. Like, this is a, a long-term goal and the, the culture of education, at least in, in the U.S. and public education, is they need to embrace that malleability and, and not looking atomistically at everything. So mm -hmm. symbolic of something really huge. I'm kind of thrilled to hear about it. Frank, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah, I have a couple of perspectives. So uh, one is kind of in line with Carolyn being... Um, starting my career as a high school English teacher, then becoming a middle school language arts teacher, middle school um, administrator, and now college professor. I look at, and, and being a writing and rhetoric person, but looking at film from the perspective of multimodal writing. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Yeah, multimodal. And, and, and also looking at the issue of rhetoric. So seeing um, the continuum, the spectrum of, of uh, communication environments um, and Yanti and I talk sometimes about, you know, the, the similarities when you're talking about film production is when I'm talking about the writing process and um, the, the continuum, the spectrum from the expository to the, to the, to the, to the literary, you know, and everything in between that I do encourage my students to fail in the process and to discover and to explore and to create from their own kind of instinct and base knowledge. And then to look at whether or not, um, they're creating art or are they creating rhetoric and there's a difference mm. and they can be artistic in their creation of rhetoric in the process but ultimately they have to focus on their purpose and their audience and their outcome and their intent and at that point is when they reach out and say am I do I know how to get there or is there something else I need to know and then that's where the learning of the, the rules come in right yeah yeah so, um, now I will say that I'm not as I'm not as cynical about public schools as a lot of folks are because I worked in an amazing middle school. Mm. It was a truly a middle school. It happens to be where Brian in the same district that Brian works at. Mm. And um, I got to see integrated learning happening authentically with art teachers working with science teachers and social studies teachers. And, and I can see the opportunity for things like this to be happening in a school like that. I've also worked in another middle school that was a junior high school trying to pose as a middle school in which none of this stuff was ever going to happen. Mm. But I, I think it really depends on, on the culture and the climate. And even now I work with an early credit program. So I work with 32 high school teachers and from high school to high school, I can see opportunities like for, for just a, a completely creative and open approach to filmmaking as part of the message in some schools and in other schools. I, again, I can see, nope, that doesn't fit the standard. So we ain't going there. 
So I, I think there's, there's yeah. a whole spectrum of, of environments you have to deal with with this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I agree with Frank. The, the middle school is a fab the middle school is a fabulous site for this because they have a mission to work in an interdisciplinary way i'm mm. i'm teaching teacher candidates right now who are placed at high schools and they're using a prescribed curriculum program called summit which is devastating to me because i think teaching is so human centered but be aware that's what you're going to be up against scope and sequence mm. Yeah, the other thing is, um, if we start looking at what kids are doing out of the classroom, they're already making videos at home. Yeah. I mean, they're on YouTube now. And so if you have too much of a disconnect between the sort of freedom, you know, to create at home, and then we bring it into this classroom, and it, they know the possibilities of video, but we sort of clamp it down into our structure, um, I think there's a problem with that. And I don't think that they're going to produce necessarily to the extent that they could if they were allowed to sort of be more creative in the way that Tom is describing. The other thing is in terms of the technology, I mean, you, it's a learn as you go proposition. You know, you make something cool, you, real, you critique it, you realize, hey, that didn't work out well. At that moment, maybe you can bring in the, the you know, the production right. points yeah, that cool. they need, you know, after they've had a chance. I don't know. That's just, I just am really attracted to what you're doing, um, Tom. I, I, this is basically what I, what I'm doing. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thank I mean, not, it's not all fleshed out in these philosophical terms, but it's just very open-ended and the students and the kids make the connections. You know, we lay out, we, we also talk about digital identities, about marginalized voices. Um, mm. Again, going back to the model of YouTube, <laughs> You know, and what and what's happening there? Yeah. Oh, that's that sounds really excellent. Yeah. I mean, one of the um, I mean, where this is all leading, I, I guess maybe I could have said this at the beginning, but um, once I graduate in May and hand in my thesis, um, which I'll send to all of you guys, um, I'm gonna start working on setting up my own cross-cultural youth filmmaking organization, starting with a, a link between students in Japan and students in the U.S where it kind of follows this um, approach to, to filmmaking, which is very, very, of course, um, you know, exploratory. Um, and um, basically have students from different parts of the world who are the same age working on projects together. And I've seen programs that are doing things like that, but um, most of them, or I guess all of them that I've seen are having students work on film projects in their own countries, then having them come together at the end in some kind of like a, film festival event and discussing them and, and, and all that. But what I'm looking at is something where the students would be able to actually collaborate throughout the process through pre-production and post. Um, and you'd have a student, for example, maybe in, you know, rural, rural America shooting, you know, some footage that could go into the film and you'd have a student maybe in Brazil or a student in Sri Lanka or a student in France or in Japan shooting um, footage for part of the same film and using the internet to, um, to figure out how it might fit together. But I think the intersection of cultural exchange, uh, filmmaking, because I mean, moving image education, I mean, we all know it's, it's taking, and I'm not even going to go into that in my thesis really, because mm, I've written about so much, you know, um, but um, you know, cross-cultural exchange, uh, filmmaking, education, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot that can be done with that just because, I mean, look at where we are right now in the world, you know, everything is becoming more insular. I mean, Japan has some pretty scary statistics too about fewer students, college students going abroad to study now than 20 years ago, which is really, really striking if you think about it. So um, I think this could be a, a good reaction to that. And we're seeing a lot of this kind of thing, like um, arts, education, um, cultural exchange, which is fantastic. But um, so that's where I'm kind of hoping to go with all this. So if you guys have any, I don't know, um, kind of suggestions, just broad suggestions, any, any, anything that I might want to look at in order to do that or to relate it more closely to my thesis, um, please let me know. Well, it really fits under global education and there's a lot going on in that particular field with mm -hmm. video. So, uh, you know, when you're ready to set that up, that would be somewhere you'd probably want. I mean, you may have already looked at that, but there's a lot no, of stuff I, I going on. Okay. Yeah, I, I look at, I'm leading the global cohort in our teacher ed program. So we've been sort of looking like what's going on out there. That's one of their assignments. And so they bring back all kinds of 
fascinating projects, including video. And a lot of the collaboration is actually, like you said, doing things together, you know, throughout a process rather than just sharing a product at some point in the exchange. So yeah. the video fits in really well. Although I guess it would be pretty complicated doing it with video or, you know, more so than some of the other things. But yeah, it's not very gonna be doable. Very doable. Yeah, yeah. Differences in tech availability and depending who you're matching up with. And sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is something that wouldn't really be fathomable um, unless you had a lot of money maybe 10 years ago. But now with you know, just simple yeah. programs like Google Classroom and yeah. Skype and stuff, um, there's a lot that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. But if you guys have any of any students that might be interested in doing doing that, then then let me know. Um, I'm going to try and, and connect schools. Um, the high school that I graduated from, which is outside of Boston, the high school that I was teaching at uh, north of Tokyo, we're going to start that connection, hopefully the beginning of next year and um, run it as kind of a trial. And then I'm going to um, yeah reach out to, to different schools and organizations in different countries and try and make it this big network. Um, easier yeah. Easier said than done, but no, you'll be able to do it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Hey, Tom, I think we've had some contact about the Northeast Regional Media Literacy Conference, but I think people would be really interested in hearing what that looks like because you'll be starting that in May and the conference mm -hmm. is not till November. So uh -huh. I would really like to see what the progress has been like that. I hope, Absolutely. I hope you'll be able to do that. I just realized that you are the Carolyn um, from, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Carolyn. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that um, would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, do you have our, our coordinates or how can I make sure I want to stay in touch with this? Yeah. Um, your thesis and, Ryan, do you have um, email? Or can we type them into the chat or something? Or uh, Yeah, why don't you type them into the chat and then I will, I will also uh, make a document with them. Yeah, and um, what was the name of your, the person you worked with in Japan? I see on the chat, somebody wrote, how do you spell it? Is it? Okay, I, I'm not seeing the chat at all, actually. Um, Open it up in the bottom the frame. Bottom. Um, Hang your cursor over the bottom and you'll see some different um, icons come up. Oh, chat? Tom, yep. is, is oh, that, um, great. Oh, is that Tokyo Garage? Is, is, was that the, the mentor of yours? Uh, uh, Tokyo, Tokyo Film Garage? Yeah. No, no, that, that was something totally different. Um, okay, so that's a different person. Yeah, that was a, a mini project that I did with some friends years ago. So the guy's name, I'll, I'll type it in here. Um, his name is Nobuhiro Suwa. Um, he is virtually unknown in the US. Um, he makes his films in France because he can't get funding from um, companies in Japan. And his latest film, just to give you an idea of how well known he is, is starring Jean-Pierre Lialde from Truffaut's The 400 Blows. Uh, <laughs> the kid in the movie, who's, he's now in his 70s. And he's worked with um, Willem Dafoe, Juliette Binoche, um, you know, big, big names. And, um, but he's only produced about six or seven films in his career. He won an award at Cannes back in 1997, which was kind of the starting point of his career. But I still don't know how we got him into our, uh, you know, high school filmmaking program. But he, the amazing thing about him is that he's, he's a filmmaker, but he's more of a philosopher. And he just, more than anyone else I've ever met um, is able to see the, the big picture and um, you know, the importance of, of what can be learned through, through filmmaking education. But he's, um, he's, he's very Zen in the sense that, I mean, I asked him, for example, I mean, do you think, or, or, or why do you think uh, film is, is, is needed in education? And he said, I don't know if it's needed. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess it could be, but, but I, I really don't know. You know what I mean? So he's very yeah. loose about that stuff. And it's good. It's good to have that kind of um, curiosity or that hunch. And he was really the one that taught me um, a lot about that, about not, not to go into this asserting that, um, you know, what you think is, is going to make a big difference or any of that. It's about, um, you know, it, it, goes, it goes back to letting go mm -hmm. and um, discovering through the, through the process. So... Anyway, <laughs> you know, is, is, have you heard the story of the Chinese farmer? I don't think so. Okay, well, I, it's too long to go into here, but look up the, the, <laughs> okay. you know, the, the Chinese farmer uh, loses his horse. Uh, the horses run away, and everybody says, "Oh, that's terrible!" And his response is, "I don't know yet." 
And then what happens is the horses all uh, bring back mates. So now he's double the size of his herd. So well, that's great. And his response is, we'll see. And, and it just goes on and on and on like that. So it's, it's kind of what you guys are. Yeah, about. yeah. It sounds a lot like a, like a Japanese koan. It's yeah. kind of, um, yeah, like, like riddles. They get you to think, um, yeah. you know, very deeply about things. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. Yeah. So um, great. Are we, are we out of time here? Uh, no, well, if, is, is everybody uh, all set? We've gone right. for a little over an hour or if, just about an hour. So if we have um, just a couple more minutes. Do you mind if I ask just one more question? Sure. Go for it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so just the end of my, um, of my thesis, I'm wondering how best to tie this all together. And um, one thing I could do, um, which would be, I guess, kind of the easier approach would be to try and tie what I'm arguing for this, this kind of approach to, you know, 21st century skills and all that. But the fact of the matter is that the 21st century skills change depending on who you're talking to. They are claims. They are not proven. Um, and I'm not personally really interested in, in, in taking that approach to my research is trying to, you know, make instrumental and you're dealing with an open system. It is, it is. And I could spend a lot of time reading literature and finding connections and doing all that, but it's not going to prove anything. And I'm not trying to prove anything. Um, but can you guys think of, um, another way that, that I might want to tie this all together in, in the um, conclusion of my, my thesis. I have some ideas, but I just wanted to hear if you guys had anything to say. With a quote from your mentor. Oh yeah, well I'm gonna embed them throughout the thesis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this I, is- I, I'd sort of like to see it left open at the end. I mean, that in between generative space, you know, it's not this or that, it's this and that, you know, that's the whole sort mm, of, mm, mm. Um, you know, Ted Aoki, you know, the philosophy, which is very, you know, part comes from the Buddhism and, and the Japanese um, thinking. Um, I know that might be sound really radical, though, um, to leave it open. But mm -hmm. rather than to say, you know, this is what we have to do, that this is a you're, you're presenting an opportunity, you're presenting an opening. And that's what I find is that all you want to do is open up a space mm. for teachers and students mm. to make videos, you're opening the space and they go for it. I mean, they, t they take it up. Yeah. In a way. And video is so unique that way. And just because of what you said about how it's not defined, it's not definitive. So, you know, opening up our imaginations to the potential at the end of these yeah. A wonderful place to leave us. Mm, mm, mm. That's really that's that's a very radical suggestion, but I like it. And also, you're leaving a space for the reader to come into the text. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, if you look at Japanese art, traditional Japanese art, you look at those big scroll paintings. You know, eighty, ninety percent of it is empty space. Yeah. That invites the viewer to complete it themselves. It's the same with Raku pottery. You know, it's flawed. It's not. You know, a, a perfectly symmetrical complete vision it's got you know um not emptiness but there's room for interpretation so it invites you to kind of play, finish it with your own mind and where you're coming from yeah i think i think that's a great idea diane um that's why i, I wrote down kintsugi do you, do you know kintsugi tom is <laughs> what is it? i thought that's where you were going with japanese pottery when mm. if kintsugi. we break pot if we break pottery in western culture we throw it away uh, mm -hmm. In Japanese culture, it's viewed as uh, an opportunity to find more beauty. So what they do is they glue it back together with uh, cement with gold dust in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. Perfections, and in the for, being forced to look at it in a new way that that the beauty comes out of it. So that's I think Diane, you hit it. And you know, I see another word that you could think around would be the word invitation. Because yeah, oh yeah, yeah. People to see it in this way, which is quite different than the way we're all seeing it, right? Yeah, I mean, those for me are always the most interesting films, the films that, um, you know, don't tell you what to think, obviously, but invite you to, to finish it. They're, they're, they're incomplete in a sense. Um, so those are kind of, I mean, this is what I go over with my students as well, is we kind of set new criterions, right, at the beginning of the, of the class. And I'm starting a, a, a experimental um, photography slash filmmaking course on Thursday that's going to be taught at RISD actually 
Um, but I'm going to tell my students that in the first class I'm going to say, look, these are our new criterions. You know, it's not about, we're not trying, we're not here to make good films because there is no such thing as a good film, you know, and really getting them to, um, to, to think differently, you know? And so I think Carolyn mentioned audience or maybe it was Frank about the whole thing about audience. Like who are they making these videos for? You know, are they making them to display their knowledge to their teachers? I mean, what is the purpose of the video making? You know, if it's just to meet curriculum expectations, like right. just maybe just, you know, do that in an essay. Okay. <laughs> you could, right? Yeah. Um, so what, who's the audience? Right, right, right. And exactly. that's what Renee is always, ta always talking about, right, is, is audience. Yeah, 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 I think so. I think so. Yeah, it's, uh, so from, from a K-12 perspective, you almost, you almost need to have, at least at, 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 with, with the current climb, you need to have those conventional films because they have a lot of, um, I can't think of a of better word than curb appeal. They, they're the ones that the general public are going to be able to, to watch and really recognize the, in quotes, craft, you know? Um, and maybe that's a necessary in order for someone to have the freedom for the exploration. In other words, I do a lot of book hooks in this school and I do a lot of newscasts in this school, but mm -hmm. that allows me to have an after school group where I, if you come, they're in the hallways and they're just completely spitballing half the time. Um, mm -hmm. So is that necessary? Is it necessary to have the kind of conventional in order to open up the path mm -hmm. for unconventional? I don't necessarily think so. I think in terms of um, having a, kind of context, contextual background or foundation of film, like if you're screening films for your students. I think um, if you do it the wrong way, or if you, I think it depends more on how you actually present them. Um, and it's a lot more complicated, of course, than saying, oh, this is just an example. I don't want you guys to copy this. Um, go out and do your own thing because that's not how the mind works. It's, it's much more complex than that. But I think, um, one thing that I try and do is, is show my students a range of films. And uh, just to show, just to let them know the, the breadth of what can be done with the medium. So one of the exercises I did very early on with my students last year, it was documentary filmmaking. I showed them five minute clips from two um, different documentary films. One of them is called Food Inc. One of them is called uh, Our Daily Bread, which is from Germany, Food Inc's from the US. And they're documentaries about mass food production. And I showed them just isolated five minute clips from each film. And um, uh, Food Inc is structured like a, like a kind of quote unquote standard documentary film. You know, there's lots of interviews, there's text. It's like got this kind of, you know, fast pace to it. Um, Our Daily Bread on the other hand is completely, um, there's no dialogue, there's no narration. And the shots are inside of this factory where, where you know, uh, chickens and stuff are, are slaughtered. Um, for, for making food. And they're just these like 40 second or sometimes minute and a half bold uh, single takes with no camera movement whatsoever. And you'll just see people in all kind of like institutionalized gowns with masks on and goggles, just like taking apart the, um, you know, cleaning the machines that, that slaughter the animals and stuff like that. And I showed my students those two films uh, back to back. And I said, okay, um, raise your hand if you, if you liked Our Daily Bread and about half the class raised their hand. Okay, raise your hand if you like Food Inc. About half the class raised their hand. And there were some students that were undecided. So I brought my students up to the front of the classroom and I said, okay, so you guys have five minutes to discuss how you're gonna convince these unconvinced students um, that your film was better. And they had to conceptualize how they were gonna, you know, they, they had to think very you know, carefully about what they liked about the film and why, they, why it worked for them. And um, I wasn't trying to teach them that one was better than the other, of course but I think it got them thinking about it's a similar subject matter, but there's such a wide range of uh, ways to cover it and to tell that kind of story. Um, so doing things like that, I think can really kind of get the students to open their minds a bit and think like, wow, there are real possibilities in filmmaking. Yeah. Or, no, I, I, I was speaking more to the, uh, from the, um, a PR angle, um, not okay. for the students, but more for the general public, for the parents and for administration, which may not readily grasp what you're doing. But if you uh, show them something more facile, uh, 
here's so here's here's a, a great little one minute long film your your kid did. I, that's that's what I'm wondering. Do you need that that public face for those who aren't going to grasp at the higher aspiration? You know. Um. That's a, that's a good question, but um, I guess my answer is is not really because in the end it's about education. It's about what the students learn. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, as long as they're learning important lessons, it really really doesn't matter what the the film looks like if it's polished or if it's totally unwatchable, um, because I think we shouldn't be assuming that our students are capable of producing films that are you know out there in the industry. Um, you know what I mean? Just because they don't have the skills, they don't have the technical knowledge, um, they don't have, um, you know, the, the resources. So, um, you know, I think that has a lot to do with uh, educators just letting go. And um, it's not like they're giving up, but it's saying, okay, well, how can we use this limited period of time in their life? They have one year, once a week, they're studying filmmaking. How can we best use this to, um, to, to, to teach them important lessons? Hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely see what you're saying, Brian, about, you know, how it's important to kind of get people on the boat. Yeah, a necessary evil kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. But, um, but I think as long as you go with, hey, this is for education, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter what. And they're what it they're like. using film to think with, right? They're using yeah. film to um, connect to text, to connect to themselves and to connect with the world. Mm. And I mean, that, we talk a lot about, you know, so-called multimodal identity texting, and you can put all these labels on it to sell it to the parents or to the teachers. Well, and that's, and that's where my, that's where my um, wondering comes from. I, I'm working with another group of people that um, there, there tends to be in academia, there's not a, that there, there's an isolation mm -hmm. where I see I see the challenges as one who who's completely on board with what Tom and Tom, I'm going to swipe some of your stuff for the next give me five. But the reality of the situation is I've got a lot of parents who, you know, I've taught film camps and I see the reactions of um, parents who watch a film that is an exploration, that is an experiment. Mm -hmm. And those may not be the parents who are going to buy into it and bring them back to this film camp. Do you, I, I don't know if I'm putting it correctly, but. No, I, I, no, I, I totally get that. Yeah, that's, um, it's an issue. So I think it's kind of an incumbent on the instructor, the educator to. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a problem telling the parents right up straight. Like um, these, these kids made, made films for, you know, the first time today it was an exploration. Um, we shouldn't, we should always keep in mind that, um, this is all about learning. It's about education. And the point is that they had a great time and they, they learned a lot. It may not be immediately apparent, but it's, it's within them and it may surface five or 10 years down the road, but they had a great time today. They met some new people. They told a story, you know, just, just check off all the things that film can teach you. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I don't have a problem doing that, but it, I, I, I totally get what you're saying about how certain parents who are not really s sensitive to art and what can be learned through art. And administrators. Um, and administrators, totally, that are looking at the product and they're going, this is unwatchable. I mean, you know what I mean? But that's yeah. just because um, what we're exposed to every day. I mean, yeah. me too. I mean, the advertisements we see, um, the, the stuff we see on TV, the movies we see, it's so polished in order to sell a product. Right. But yeah, um, the product is the big thing. Yeah, yeah. So if you can recognize that, if you can kind of, again, zoom out from that and look at what is really going on and try and somehow get the, the parents to understand that or the administrators, mm -hmm. then I think you're getting somewhere. And, and because I come from literacy rather than filmmaking, I approach it through literacies and this is a new literacy. I mean, I'm not, that's not what you're doing here and I don't want you to use those terms, but I mean, that's a language that the school understands and that, or, well, they don't really, but they're starting to understand, you know, <laughs> that there's these other literacies beyond reading and writing. I mean, that, that exist alongside reading and writing that if our kids can't be involved in them and have hands-on experiences with them, then we're really doing them a disservice. Yeah. They're, they're their own form of reading and writing. I would argue. Yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, well, I see two of us have left. <laughs> um, thank you for, um, for, for listening and, and offering some great comments. This has been 
really, really good. I'm going to, you know, I recorded it, so I'm going to listen to it and put a lot of this um, into my thesis. So great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Yanti's going to upload this to the Media Education Lab um, channel. So uh, sometime over the next few days, it will be available to anybody else. Cool. And Brian, thank you for, for sharing it. It was wonderful. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. I'm glad it, <laughs> I'm glad it worked. So. Yeah, yeah. We got it to work. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. I'll sign off. Okay. okay. Take care. All the best. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you.